today, you can open your eyes slowly. We'll have something a bit unique um, where I don't get to talk today, which is kind of nice. So um, we're going to have a chance, for those who don't know, we had about uh, 30 of our community go on a trip to Thailand and India last month as a pilgrimage. The idea being that if we're beginning this project, um, what will hopefully be a refuge for generations, we wanted to start it symbolically from the center, from the root of the Bodhi tree and the feet of the masters. And that having a few in the community um, go and touch that place um, at the very start was significant. So um, the hope is that that uh, trip can ripple into everyone here and the sort of faith and knowledge gained be something we all share. Um, so we get to put them on the spot today. Uh, so what I was thinking um, was we we're going to have a, pilgrims, a pilgrimage story session today um, where those pilgrims that are willing uh, can come up and maybe speak a bit to a few of their most significant experiences um, and what the pilgrimage meant to them. And when they do it, you know, it'd be good if people were aware of the time and how many people we have. So, you know, around five minutes at most for people, but that's not strict. Um, and I, I'm debating between just like having people sit up here one by one, which feels a little bit intimidating, or we could back the camera up and have people sit in kind of a, just everyone is kind of willing to participate, sit in a row of chairs up here and pass a mic. What should we do? That second one? Let's do the second one. It's less scary. Okay, so we'll need a free-floating mic instead of this one, and then we'll back up the camera and take off the zoom, and then we need chairs, and we also need pilgrims. <laughs> so if you're, there's no obligation, but if you did go on the pilgrimage and are willing to kind of share, um, then you can come up, and if you just want to sit there quietly, and that's okay too, but... Um, maybe the inspirational strike. So yeah, just uh, if people wanted to one by one take a bit of time and just share your most meaningful experiences. Um, and really like, you know, we've got time, so go for it, Sam. Um, yeah, and, and what, what you'd sort of take back for people or, or bring back or speak about. I just want to be the quiet sitter. <laughs> Testing. Whoa. <laughs> uh, I'll repeat what I said, which is I was just planning to be a quiet sitter, just to have more bodies to warm each other. Um, and I've spoken twice now, so I'll give more space to people who haven't, but something I don't think I did speak to for you know the experience that I'm very grateful for Ajahn for leading was uh, just the space to have to form new spiritual friends, Kali Antimitas, was very nice. Like, w one of my happiest moments was just sitting at the dwellings that we would be at, and it was in between, like, a meditation session at Wat Mop John, and we were all, like, wearing white and black, like, just drinking this nice uh, uh, instant coffee, and it was like, oh, there's, like, eight of us in a circle. It's like, this is so nice. So... And we have a lot of Kalyanamitas here. So that same warmth could always be with us. So, uh, yeah, be well. So I've actually been a little bit hesitant to talk about pilgrimage. I never know. Like when somebody asks me how it was, my brain just goes kind of soft and fuzzy. And um, I think there's just something, like I've just wanted to keep it kind of close. Like there's something really special and not that I don't want to share it, but um, it just hasn't wanted to be shared all that publicly much yet. 
But when Nisibo was, um, uh, when Ajahn Nisibo <laughs> was, was beginning meditation, um, he said something about, I can't remember exactly what it was now, but it was about um, just sort of expanding and listening. And it brought up actually um, a memory for me uh, from Bodh Gaya, which was really quite um, intense for me. It was really chaotic and like I had built it up. It was like on my bucket list of, you know, the first thing that I've achieved from my bucket list actually of, you know, meeting the Bodhi tree. So it was built up for a long time. And so we get there and it's like crazy. There's like people going everywhere in the road and there are cows and cars <laughs> and tuk-tuks and people and poverty and it was really a lot of things, right? So we get there and, and I, um, everyone's chanting. There are all these different groups and they're chanting at different times and I just thought, I'm not going to be able to meditate here. This is oh no, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Anyway, and we met with um, Ajahn Achilo, who is this very interesting monastic who sets these really intense aditanas for himself, like meditate for 500 million hours under the Bodhi tree, and then he like <laughs> achieves them, and like, you know, so, and then and then um, Ajahn Kovilo and Ajahn Nisibo were talking to us about setting aditanas for ourselves, for the, the group, for the pilgrimage. And, you know, I'm usually like as much of a control freak about everything as everyone else. And I just was blank, like, what is my intention? What is my aditana? Like, nothing was coming to me. And so everything just felt sort of weird. And so when you go into the Mahabodhi temple and you're near the tree, there's this, you can sort of circumambulate around it. And there's this beautiful place where, um, it, I think it's sort of like where they think the Buddha actually sat, right, to, to become awakened. And there's this stone where people um, rest their head and you'll see people like rub their mala on it or rub who knows what on it. <laughs> Um, and so the first time I did that, right, so you, you're walking around, and sometimes you have to wait um, for other people to put their face on it and be done, and I, I, I just leaned in, and I put my head against the stone, and it was the first time, it was like everything went quiet, and I can't even, I don't even know if I can tell you what that felt like, but it was just this beautiful sort of integration and I um, and so I just said what should my aditana be and I just listened and I just felt this like message of you just need to listen more deeply more subtly like 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 you don't need to put your intention on this just listen and pay attention so that's what I've been working with. Like, I don't think I set the best, like not that my, my intentions are wrong, but just that I limit the possibility with my own thinking about what I need to do or set or whatever. And so I just kind of let it go. I was like, okay, I guess my intention is to just listen and not miss so much with setting my own intentions. So anyway. Um, and that spot is just my favorite. The whole experience in India was kind of hard, except I don't know how many times I put my face on that stone, but every time I walked by, if there was an opening, I just kind of put my face there. And man, is that a powerful spot. So I hope you all get to put your face there sometime, because <laughs> it's really something. Not ready to, but okay, I'll try.
um, the first morning at the Wat Map Chan, so we wake up like four o'clock in the morning and we walk up five o'clock to the hall. I heard sound of the monk chanting. It's just, it's just beautiful. And when we get to the hall, there's a beautiful hall too. 30, 40 monks chanting. It's with me until today. And to close to Kuba Ajan, I feel metta from them, kindness, gentleness, they all with my heart and that make me feel go practice and meditation more and more in time. I, I just what what happened to me? <laughs> and every time, I just I just find my my time to to go meditation. That all energy from this pilgrimage is. This is beautiful. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Prata. I feel similarly to Kim, where it's like still a lot of processing going on and yeah, same as you too, <laughs> just kind of hard to talk about. Um, but it feels really precious to be up here with all of you right now and reconnecting a little bit over this. Um, yeah, I just, I feel after the pilgrimage, like I just feel really different. It's, everything around me feels different, but I don't know why exactly and I don't know how and I don't know how to move forward with this deeper faith that I have now, but we'll just see what unfolds. Um, one thing that really struck me about the trip was I don't really need that much to be happy. I, when we went to Wat Mop John the first night, I was like, okay, we're just, we're sleeping on these, <laughs> I don't know what they are called in Thai, but these little mats and a pillow that you know, kind of looks like a brick to me, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just a ceiling fan and just a thin sheet, um, but just in the most beautiful setting, and, you know, um, incredible monks and teachers, and, 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 and then we went to Ajahn Jundi's place after that, and Wat Mop John, <laughs> bed seemed really luxurious in comparison. <laughs> Um, it was a straw mat, and there was wild dogs that woke us up at 2 a.m., and roosters flying through the trees, and I was like, oh, I wasn't sure if I was going to make the 3.30 a.m. meditation, but the dogs woke us up, and I was like, I guess I'm, <laughs> I guess I'm going to go meditate now, but my mind was so bright. I was so happy. Um, I felt like the, that, I don't even know how many days we were there, really, but it was just the happiest I think I've I've ever felt, and so it's been a really good lesson for me coming back, especially um, moving into a new space this past week. And I'm just selling things left and right. I just feel like I don't I don't. That's not where true happiness comes from. And it's like I knew that intellectually, but kind of seeing what I actually needed to be happy was very transformative. Um, and. I, yeah, one of the Kruba Ajans too, I just remember him saying, like, this is, the Dhamma is true wealth. The Dhamma is true wealth, and it, it really is. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to keep pointing my heart towards the Dhamma and see what unfolds. But 
I know that the pilgrimage will be with me for 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 a long time to come and I don't know how else it'll transform me but something's happening in in here so yeah thank you Yes, my experience of Dhamma uh, was through my partner at the time, and it was like, man, it's so good for him that he's like such a dedicated practitioner, and um, I guess I want to celebrate my willingness to go on the trip because I felt like a bit of a like Thai forest like tourist, where it's like, ooh, what is this Thai forest thing about? And like we got to be in it like we got to see the monasteries meet the meet the ajans and i don't think i knew the depth of that experience and what it was going to oh there's some tears there like do for my practice um i just there's a sense of like all you have to have is willingness on this path and inspiration and faith will show up um I was just telling Willary, we were talking about the quote that um, inspiration wants to find you working. And so we were working on this trip. We were meditating, we were getting on the van, and <laughs> <laughs> lots of vans. <laughs> and like there were just so many moments of grace on the trip. And those are the ones that tend to like kind of bubble up for me. The, like Kim described, the, the Mahabodhi temple was, it was loud and wild and so much energy. And you had to go through two security checks, like put your bag through the x-ray, get a pat down, two. Um, and you know, all the monks go through it too. Everybody just gets in line. And some stray dogs would also go through the security line. <laughs> And they would end up in the Mahabodhi temple. And so we would get there real early to meditate. And I remember one morning where it was just like, oh, this is so hard. And I am not feeling it. And you're like, sorry, Bodhi tree. Like, <laughs> just if I sit here long enough, maybe like that energy will come. And I really just kind of opened myself up to whatever faith, like inspiration was going to show up. Um, and so I was sitting next to Kim and we looked down and there was a puppy sitting next to, it had just like saddled up next to me on this cold morning in India. And it's just like, or maybe it was next to you. I, in my mind, it was my puppy. <laughs> like it was like <laughs> sent there to make my morning <laughs> bearable. <laughs> and we were just like, oh, like you can have all these elements. There was like the grace and the, the hard moments and there was always a sense of being held and that has really what's carried me through as I've come back um, kind of to real life. It's like touching into how supported I am by being on this path. So I'm, I'm very grateful to share my experience. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Willary and I'll start off with a deep gratitude to the Ajans, Ajahn Misabo and Ajahn Kovala for starting this pilgrimage journey and being part of it for all of us. And a deep gratitude to the Sangha because you were in it just as, you know, just as much as we were. Um, we held, I think we held each other and thank you for holding us pilgrims during that time, and then also a deep gratitude to the pilgrims who held each and every one of us in the Sangha. I've shared some experiences, and uh, to be quite honest, similar to Kim and Katie, and I think most, a lot of the pilgrims, there's a lot of processing that needs to happen, and sometimes I, I'm not encouraged to share, but I'm also encouraged to share at the same time because, you know, I've also been inspired by those who have shared their experiences, and there's a lot to take from that. 
I think one of the things that I haven't shared um, is <laughs> maybe days in, we were still in the pilgrims, I think it was after Thailand, and I had texted one of my friends and exclaimed, Guan Yin is real. <laughs> and I have never, I didn't know Guan Yin and what she represented, uh, what the, you know, her form, what it represented. I think the only thing that I knew prior to this, you know, ex, you know, proclamation is, you know, she was a Bodhisattva and she was in the female form as seen by in the Eastern, you know, Buddhist traditions and that she was love and compassion. Outside of that, I didn't really know anything about the Bodhisattvas and um, her representation. But on the last morning when we were at Wat Mark John, um, well maybe, let me go back. When we first got to Wat Mark John, um, Ajahn's um, took us to the temple where um, there's a temple specifically for uh, Guan Yin and also her friends. Um, so we got to know a little bit more about Guan Yin. Uh, and they think I was like, okay, there's there's a lot more to uh, Guan Yin and her story uh, and how, what she represents in the Dhamma and in the path. And I think on the the day prior to the last day, I went in and, and just meditated in the temple um, for about 30 minutes. But on the last morning, uh, we had to go outside of the sala and we were, you know, doing walking meditation and sitting meditation out in the sala. And it's morning, and you can hear the cacophonies of different birds and things like that. It was really beautiful. And then I started out with walking meditation, and then I sat down. And I sat, when I, as soon as I sat down, I closed my eyes. In my visual field, Guan Yin and her friends showed up. And they were just there in my vision. Like, glowing as they were. And with them came this love that I've never experienced before and I've never known. It's a love that was, uh, that had no bounds and it had, it didn't bend towards anyone. It wasn't wrinkled. You know, when, when you say, oh, I have love for you, we always love the ones closest to us. So it bends towards those close around you. And when, even when you say unconditional love, there's a wrinkle, right? There's a wrinkle to that. There's like boundaries that you set. And in this love that, I, that they came with, it had no bounds, it didn't wrinkle, it didn't bend towards anyone, towards me. I'm no, it wasn't any special than the one close to me or any being, and it was just, I've never experienced anything like that. And that's when I realized, wow, that, is, that Guan Yin is real and that love, that compassion is real. And um, my friend told me earlier, he was like, well, you just ex probably experienced Maha Karuna, which is the great love. And I think that's, yeah, that's how I would define it. Um, so I'd like to share that, so everybody can take away. Um, I'm, I'm grew up in the area near Long Pucha, the temple. So we grew up in the temple like that, and the monks like that atmospheres. I have been to pilgrimage many times, but not because of I want to go. I, my mom was nun, so I joined her pilgrimage when I was six or seven years old to, uh, to visit uh, Long Tamahabua, to visit Ajahn Fan with all these Kuba Ajahn, high spiritual being, but I just so young then, I don't know this is special. Then, my husband liked traveling, so we joined the Hindu to Amarnath Cape in Kashmir. 
And then we walk around Mount Kailas in Tibet. And we went to Camino in Spain. All of this, he pla his plan. But this time is my own. So I, I almost not going. Thank you to Chanita. She said, if you're not going, you will not regret, you will regret the rest of your life, which is true. I have been listening and studying, read the book of Ajahn Jayasaro for 20 years. And I think he, I told every, my friends and my mother, my sister, he is my teacher. Even I told Ajahn Lumpur Pasan no that Ajahn Jayasaro is my teacher. And he asked, did you meet him? He said, no, and Ajahn Lumpur Pasan no laughed so much. You said you're a teacher, but you never meet him. <laughs> so, but his teachings is changed my life. Being away from Thailand, I listened to his talk. So I said, and Chanita said, you must go, you must go. So I said, okay, this pilgrimage is my own. I, I will go. And this is, a, this is a real for my own string of the practice of sata. So, I can say that uh, my moment that I, t I see my teacher, Ajahn <laughs> Jasaro, I said, oh, he looked like the one on TV. <laughs> 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 but the moment that we sat at that evening, we sat outdoor, only candlelight, we meditate, together, all of us, and then I was meditating. And suddenly Ajahn Kovido said, Vanida, please request for the Dhamma talk. That's, I never think I have chance to do that in my life, because I know he is, he's so famous, it's hard to get to see him. But to me, it's just like a, something that happened to my heart. And I asked for the Dhamma talk at that moment. And before I went to this pilgrimage, I have Aditana that, you know, whatever I do, please give me strength to practice more, to demolish unwholesome and accumulate more wholesome action, thought, and speech in the mind, a wholesome way to daily practice. I need the strength to do that. And then after I meet this Kuba Ajahn, like Chanida, I don't know, it motivates me to do more. It, it's, it's more than I, I mean every day, is I want to do more, more practice and more better, better a person. And then when I meet and talk to Ajahn Chasalo, he even kinder than I thought. His metta, his compassion, even more, more, more than I, more than imagine. Of course, all the Kuba Ajahn, the other one, but, but this is my guide and my teacher, so I said this is a very special moment for me when I have chance to ask for his teaching myself. So then, even more than that, when I told him that I would take the painting that he gave to our community back, and he speak very loudly, he said, Vanida, Satu, Satu, Anumodana, he said to me. And that's very print with me. So this is a, what I, 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 I share, my moment that I, I feel for this pilgrimage and give me very, very, uh, um, have more, even sata, more, more, more strength to, to, to continue my practice, to change myself, to, 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 to make myself 
happy at the same time as make other people happy as well. Thank you. So if uh, people have any questions for the pilgrims, they can ask, but also if some of the pilgrims have more they'd like to say or any specific teachings that stuck with you, we have time. Uh, the teaching that I remember, or no, I can get from all other teachers will say, when, when, when Ajahn Kuvilo, Ajahn Nisapu asks all the Kubajan, every monk, every Kubajan asks that we're going to start our, build our community and the, all our temples. And he said, build yourself first, not only monastic, the lay people, you have to build yourself to practice well first, then the monastic will come through. That's what all Kuba Ajahn said, everyone. Ajahn Suchad, Ajahn Long Po Tan, Ajahn Tan, Ajahn Anand. That's all they said. And then another teaching, I remember that Mechi Banyasiri said, we, we are, we are, tougher than we thought. Mm, we are tougher than we thought. What is it? Or we are, we are stronger than we thought. He said, stronger than we thought to fight the kilesa, the defilement. That's what he said. Thank you. I do want to shout out one person a little bit who I feel like had a really, did a really cool thing in India, but I'm not sure has spoken. And uh, I'm not sure if I should speak for somebody else, but it's Hiram who always sit, sits in the back. And he did a very impressive feat of circumnabulating around the large circle of the Mahabodhi temple 108 times. <laughs> and 20 miles. Yeah. <laughs> And I remember shouting it out somebody else who I think Art, who's, who's a common member, uh, Harm was on his last round, I think feet probably just in agony. He's like, okay, we're gonna do it. And then Art just, without knowing it was his final one, was like, hey Harm, here's, here's a rose, like proud of you. And I think that I'm speaking for Harm completely right now, but I think that meant a lot to him. So there's a lot of great pilgrims. Uh, yeah. Sade, <laughs> sade, sade. If anyone has questions for the pilgrims, we got a few minutes. A Zoom is fine as well. You can raise an electronic hand and we can call on you. I'll just say a little something right now while people think about a question they might bring up or something they might say. Um, one of the balancing acts has been, you know, really wanting everyone to understand that this was um, a pilgrimage which the whole community um, will hopefully be a part of and um, in, a, in a broader sense. And touching into the root of the tradition was significant, but whatever kind of magic and heart rests in that society and those teachers and those practitioners, that exact same note has, I've really heard it ring out in this community. And I think everyone that stepped into this strange gym with its you know, flashing lights and <laughs> noise and, and like very reliable leaf blower right at meditation time, <laughs> every time, um, you know, I, I think, I think everyone's felt like there's something very special here, and there is, you know, I, um, we're, we have eight less people than we would have, except eight, at least about eight of our members are off seeking ordination. 
you know, there's something really profound happening here. And um, this vision, which is coming together, I mean, we're only a year and a half old. And yet what we're hoping, you know, is to find a piece of property within, you know, maybe 35 minutes of here, if we can, but secluded in the forest um, and have a place where people can come every day. And that's what you see in Thailand is these, these monasteries that grow because it's just a daily part of people's lives. And, um, and we really think we can do that. Um, you know, to have this place and, you know, the, the ideal schedule being to, uh, you know, early morning chanting for those who can make it. And then some of the monks go on alms round and people can meet them. Um, meanwhile, others can come to the monastery and offer a meal and talk with the monks uh, and share a meal. Um, then those who want can stay at the monastery meditating, gardening, reading the library all day if we can keep it open. Um, and then in the afternoon have a tea time where people can come after their work and talk and meditate, evening chanting into the night and meditation. Um, maybe an all-night meditation every week, we'll see. Uh, and then, you know, meanwhile to have these huts where when the monastics aren't there, um, lay people can come and stay for a few days, a week, uh, a month, um, all of course for free because this entire thing rests on generosity. And the, you know, idea that this might be small at first, but that it'll grow. Um, and it's this beautiful, you know, and then to have a, um, a place where visiting uh, nuns and bhikkhunis can stay as well and, and visit. And, and we, I think it's something that this community can do. And I think, um, like all the Ajahn said around where we start, uh, this idea that what we're cultivating now in, you know, the middle school, elementary school gym is, is really where it all begins in terms of cultivating a community where people do not gossip about each other um, ever, where we hold each other not based on each other's personalities, but because we're all practitioners, you know, together, um, where we're all, you know, really holding precepts around not lying, not killing, uh, not taking what is not given, um, and where we cultivate a a high bar for what practice can be, you know, in terms of really um, dedicating some time to the heart every day um, and and learning to create something that is truly precious and will be a resource for, for many, many years and hopefully generations. Um, so all to say that, y y you know, this, whatever note people heard there, I, I really hear it here and I think they all do as well. And when you know, every night when we were in Bodh Gaya, we'd all gather around, um, basically gather and, and make a determination for Clear Mountain Monastery as um, a gift to the Buddha, to all generations. And um, that was an aspiration made with everyone here in mind. Um, so yeah, just to say, uh, I, I'm very grateful for the pilgrims that shared their experiences and Whatever was there, um, I think will be here, um, even though it looks a bit different at the moment. So um, yeah, I just wanted to contextualize that as well and rejoice in what, I mean, these last year and a half has very much felt like falling in love and I don't think, you know, I, I think we've all kind of felt that. Um, so yeah, I, we've got a little more time for things people would want to say or ask um, of the pilgrims. Yeah, we can do three sadhus for the community vision too. Why not? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I guess I could say one, one more thing. Um, Sort of on, uh, I was thinking about, I think it was Mark who every um, teacher that we met with, he would ask the same question. And it was something like, um, what is the most important quality to develop uh, on the spiritual path? Something like that. And um, 
yeah, what is most helpful to develop on the spiritual path? And he asked it the same question in the same way to every teacher we met with. <laughs> and um, what I loved was almost all of them gave a different answer. <laughs> and I just felt sort of like, yeah, right? They're all sort of important, but also it's just about, I mean, they were, and they were all right. You know what I mean? Like it was all true. And so I just sort of felt like there's a lot of space on the path for your orientation to practice, right? We all sort of have a door or a gate and, um, and they were all right. And it just felt a little bit like, oh, there's not so much pressure. There's not one right answer. Um, it's a little softer than that. But I loved that he asked the same question. I hope that somebody was writing down all the answers. Um, you remember too? Here, I'll give this to you. Uh, the same question is, Ajahn Chayasaru, I remember. Ajahn Chayasaru said the humor. The humor. And then Mechi Panyasiri said, Kanti, patient endurance. And Ajahn, Ajahn Suchar. I think he said Metta. Yeah, was it Ajahn Anand? Ajahn Anand said Metta. Mm, compassion is three. We got we got eight more. This is the Dharma. <laughs> this is the Dharma. <laughs> I think it's Ajahn Suchar. Ajahn Suchar said Dharma. Yeah. I hope I write. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one who can give this answer Sati. is uh, Sati. Ajahn Long Ho Chandi. Yeah, I think. Oh, oh, Ajahn Chandi said uncertainty. My name. Uh, in Thai language. My name. Okay. And what else do you remember? Ajahn Piak also said uncertainty. Also. Oh, Ajahn Piak. Not that you should be uncertain, but that recollecting that things are uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is very interesting. Uh, Mark asked the same question, same question to everyone, and we have to get to very, very. I don't remember what Ajahn Tan said. Do people want to say anything more about Ajahn Jayasaro and like what he, any recollections from his teachings? Because I don't remember all the answers to that one either, but Ajahn Jayasaro is worth, or Mechi Panyasiri also, there was a lot there. Everyone of us talk about Mechi Panyasiri. She's the, um, she's the nun who student of Ajahn Jayasaro. She's only four fansa, right, Ajahn? Uh, Ajahn, only four years of training under Ajahn Chayasaro. And she grew up in Shanghai. So she went to Thailand to become Mechi. And just the first thing she said, we just stuck on us. And I asked many questions about uh, women practice, you know, what's the difference you do? And then she said, we are the same. We are Bakanda. We have form and name in our body. We are the same. It's up to us to whatever you are, whatever you are, it's up to us to create our opportunity to, to practice. So she talked about her condition in Thailand as a woman and she said, this is a make a good point to us. Make a good point that we can have opportunity like men, but this is a good point because we have chance to practice more and contemplate, use that to be possible, to be, to be in a positive way of training. He said, we are the same and we have to, we, 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 nobody can give us the, the opportunity. We create ourselves. And that's why her, her, her word for the, the help her spiritual practice is patient endurance. Kanti, and she talk about, and she very inspire us, all of us want to do more, don't you think so? Mm, want to practice more. So it doesn't matter, because in Thailand you are gay, you are lesbian, you are whatever. In Thailand we accept everyone practice. So when I saw her, when I saw her talk about her life, it's very inspired me and very impressed that we all can do it, whoever we are. We all can practice. If this nun from Shanghai can go to study in Thailand, 
and be like that, we can do it too. She go all the way out. That's what I, I and then, and you can talk about Ajahn Chesalo. <laughs> <laughs> I have been thinking about Ajahn Jaya Saro um, in terms of what not to take from, from that, from him. Um, he had told, shared with us that he never thought about disrobing. He's like, this is the form I've always wanted to be in and I am in and ne over the, nothing nothing can sort of sway him otherwise. And in that form, the service that he provides to a lot of people, you know, he's, you know, he's providing Dhamma talks to the royals, mm. to the kids, to the school, to the foundation, to us. Like, what an impact in a lifetime and you know, like he's just meant to, like he's just all about service. Mm. And you can see that in all the things that he does, whether he's starting, you know, a new school that revolves around the Dhamma, when, you know, he had this um, like thought about, you know, having this constitution or this laws that you sign for families. And Kim had asked him, can you write a book about that? And Granted, I'm sure he's so busy, but you know, he, he did think about it. He said, yeah, maybe I will. <laughs> so, like the service, I have, I, I think he embodies service to all of us um, and so generous in that. And that's what I sort of kind of took away after just thinking to myself, what is it? And I think I'd like to add the one thing that he also gave um, Amechi Panyasiri before she went into solitude. He said, look, listen, and learn. And that is so powerful. And I took that in and I'm, you know, it's now it's look, listen, and learn. Not talk so much, but <laughs> look, listen, and learn. And I think you will find a lot in that. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I think we have to wrap things up. Um, one uh, thing, uh, Ajahn Jaya Saro, his name was Sean, uh, and in Thai, that sounds like chon, which means spoon. So he was known as Ajahn Spoon. <laughs> he still is. People are like, do you know Ajahn Spoon? And I'm like, I think we're talking about the same monk. He, um, he also had, uh, he was tag teamed with Longpur Pasno's abbot of Wat Pananachat for years, but he never wanted it. He wanted to kind of go to a hermitage. And so for his first few years at the hermitage, he had a little sign out front that said, visitors welcome 2 to 3 a.m. every Sunday. <laughs> And uh, the final thing is he, he was very dedicated to Longpur Cha. And uh, Ajahn Cha was in this you know, series of illnesses where he became really paralyzed and they thought he was gonna die. And so there, you know, there's this one night where they're like, okay, this is, this is kind of the end, like he's really passing away. And Ajahn Jayasar was like, all right, I'm gonna determine not to lie down until he passes away as a way of honoring my teacher. And then Ajahn Cha went on to live for another five years or four years. <laughs> called it Ajahn Chah's last joke on him. So uh, Ajahn, uh, it was a true act of devotion, but he, yeah, he did it. He didn't lie down for four, four or five years. Um, thank you, all the pilgrims. And for those who haven't um, looked, uh, we have a series of reflections up on the website under the writings uh, where many and many who aren't present wrote um, about their, their time. Um, and we'll also, we're finishing restringing some malas, but we had blessed malas uh, by most of these teachers, and we'll be giving those out so everyone can have, have part of that. <laughs>